Hey everyone, welcome to Judging for the Win. I'm Dave, and this is my daily ruling. Today, I'm going to be talking about the new station mechanic from Edge of Eternities. There's a few unusual quirks about station cards, but if you're familiar with the leveler cards from Rise of the Eldrazi, that's fundamentally the same mechanic, other than the fact that for some reason the rules team didn't give station cards a shout out in the numbers and symbols section of the CR. So, the first and most important thing about station cards is that they change the rules so that legendary spacecraft that can turn into a creature can be your commander. Vehicles too, with the same stipulation that they have to be legendary. This is probably the thing that's going to come up the most, especially after these cards rotate out of standard, so I put it right up in the front of the video. If that's all you needed, be sure to leave a like and a comment on your way out so the algorithm doesn't punish me too hard. Now, if you actually want to learn how spacecraft and planets work, buckle up and hang on tight. Now, let's first notice that all the station cards have a striated text box. Any abilities in the top part of the text box, the part that does not have a little number in a bubble off to the left side, you can think of those as just the normal part of the text box of the card. The station card always has those abilities in every zone, just like any normal magic card. Stuff in other parts of the text box only exists if the station card is on the battlefield with the appropriate number of charge counters on it, as indicated in the bubble on the left. So let's say that you played the Eternity Elevator for 5 mana. It would enter the battlefield as an artifact that could tap for 3 mana. Once you get 20 or more charge counters on it, the Eternity Elevator gains the abilities in the bottom part of its text box, meaning that you can tap it for X mana of any color. You might have also seen some stations that have a power and a toughness box. So, for example, if you play Lumen Class Frigate, it will enter as just an artifact. Once it gets two charge counters, it will gain the ability that gives your other creatures plus one, plus one, and hitting 12 charge counters will make it a 3-5 flying and lifelink creature. Because 12 is more than two, it will still have its ability from the middle two plus striation, even after achieving its final form. Same thing goes for if you have more than 12 charge counters on it rather than exactly 12. That won't change anything about Lumen Class Frigate's characteristics. But how would you get that many charge counters on them in the first place? And as you might have guessed, the answer is the Station keyword ability that you've seen on all these cards so far. Station means tap another untapped creature that you control, colon, put a number of charge counters on this permanent equal to the tapped creature's power. Activate only as a sorcery. So there's a couple of interesting things to note, which is that the station card does not intrinsically have the station ability by virtue of being a planet or a spacecraft. It's a normal activated ability that could be removed with like stop cold or suppressed by a petrify. Another interesting thing is that the creature's power is checked on the resolution of the station ability, meaning that you could respond to that ability by changing the creature's power. If you shrink the creature in response, the new lower power would be used, although a negative power would not result in counters being taken off. Destroying the creature in response will also probably leave you a little disappointed. If the creature that was tapped is no longer on the battlefield as the station ability resolves, the game checks its power as it last existed on the battlefield and it uses that value. Now that we've got the basic set, let's go through a few challenge questions. First off, Amy has a Lumen Class Frigate with 13 charge counters on it and she also controls a quest for renewal. Can she tap Lumen Class Frigate to activate its own station ability just to get a quest counter on her enchant. And unfortunately this does not work. The station says you have to tap another creature that you control, so it is not possible for one of these cards to station itself, which I suppose makes sense given what's flavorfully supposed to be going on here. Note that there's absolutely no problem with stationing extra after you reach the final form. So if Amy had another creature, she could tap that to add some more charge counters just because. All right, next up, we'll say Amy attacks with the Grizzly Bears and Nick has a Lumen Class Frigate at 11 counters. Then Nick plays a Steady Progress to proliferate another charge counter onto his spacecraft and block with it. Is this possible? And the answer is, yeah, it is. The station cards only care about how many charge counters they have on them, not where those charge counters came from. Once Lumen Class Frigate gets up to 12, it's a creature that can attack and block just like any other. The fact that they use charge counters for these is really great for deck builders who like to brew. There's a lot of shenanigans that can go on because a bunch of other stuff randomly uses charge counters as well. Since all charge counters are fungible, this opens up a lot of possibilities. Well, what if Amy attacked with a Lumen Class Frigate, Nick blocked it with a 5-3, and then he used Vampire Hex Mage to remove all the charge counters from Amy's station? Well, as before, the Lumen Class Frigate 
depends on its charge counters to give it its abilities and its creature typing. Losing those counters means it's back to being a non-creature artifact. If an attacking creature stops being a creature, it is removed from combat. As such, it won't deal or be dealt any combat damage. This also means that Amy won't gain life via the lifelink ability from this combat. Okay, well how about this? Amy has a Grizzly Bears with a plus one plus one counter on it, and she taps that to activate her Lumen Class Frigate Station ability. In response, Nick plays a Flicker of Fate against the bear. What happens? And the answer here is that three charge counters are put on Amy's station. Changing zones makes the Grizzly Bears a new object with no relationship to its past self. When the station ability resolves, it will ask what Grizzly Bears' power was. But unfortunately, Grizzly Bears is no longer on the battlefield. A brand new object with no relationship to the Grizzly Bears that was used to activate that ability is there instead. And so the game uses the last known information about Grizzly Bears' power. Because that power was 3 the last time the bear was on the battlefield, that's the number that gets used. Next, Amy taps Tapestry Warden for Station. Then Nick dismembers it in response. What happens? Well, the first important fact that we need is that Tapestry Warden's ability is a static ability that affects the results of the Station ability. Like all static abilities, this one only applies while Tapestry Warden is in the appropriate zone, i.e. the battlefield. Now therefore, when the Station ability resolves, the game will not see any ability saying that you should use Tapestry Warden's toughness, so you would use its power. And next up, the game would need to determine what Tapestry Warden's power is. Like before, it is not on the battlefield when the game is trying to get this value, so the last known information is used. As it last existed on the battlefield, Tapestry Warden's power was negative 2. Therefore, no counters are put on Amy's station. I'll leave it to the audience to determine what would change about this answer if Nick had used a damage or other destruction-based removal spell such as Flame Javelin or Fatal Push to kill the Tapestry Warden instead of Dismember. All right, Nick controls a 12 counter Loom class frigate and Amy copies it with a clone. What are clone stats? Well, if you've been a fan of the channel for a while now, you probably already know that if you were to clone an animated man land or vehicle, the clone would enter as an unanimated equivalent. And that same ruling holds here. Station cards rely on the counters on them to animate or gain their extra abilities. Copy effects do not copy the counters that are on a permanent, so the clone would enter as just a base Lumen class frigate. It would copy the station ability though, so it would be possible to eventually build that clone up to a 3-5 flying lifelinker itself. Okay, and now for my new least favorite sentence as a judge, what about Deadpool? Although this one is surprisingly straightforward. Although it's striated, the station cards are still considered to have a single text box. Therefore, Deadpool would take all of that into its own text box, pasting the Deadpool text over the station card in exchange. Unlike in the clone example, the Deadpool will still be a creature because the type line and power toughness are not considered part of the text box, so Deadpool will keep those. The station will lose its ability that was making it a creature, so it will go back to being just an artifact. Even though it won't be a creature, it would still be legal to sacrifice the station and pay three for each other player to draw a card. As in the clone example, the Deadpool would acquire the station ability, meaning that it would be possible to add charge counters to it and eventually promote it to the second or third striation. The way the power toughness setting abilities on station cards are worded, that power toughness would overwrite Deadpool's original 5-3, and the Deadpool would gain the abilities appropriate to whatever amount of charge counters were on it. Okay, so I guess that wasn't super straightforward after all, but I guess it's not as bad as it could have been. And speaking of that, yeah, could have seen that coming. I guess it's time for Judge's other least favorite question. So with a humility out, we're going to need to take a look at the comprehensive rules to see the actual text of the station abilities. So if you have a station out, this is what the game officially sees, which I guess is why they condense things down to this triated text box. So yeah, we've got some continuous effects here, and the way you handle that is to put them into their appropriate layers. So in layer 4, the type changing effect from the station is going to make it into an artifact creature hype in spacecraft. And by the way, whenever I talk about layers, especially whenever I talk about Magus of the Moon, I get a bunch of comments about how horrible the system is and blah blah blah. Well, I just wanted to point out that without layers, or if dependencies were extended so that they could go through layers, uh, you might end up with a situation where a creature station was not affected by a humility. And that doesn't make a lot of sense to me, but maybe some of you think differently. So let me know in the comments how you think that should work out. So anyway, the after layer 4, we would get three effects in layer 6, which is when ability adding and removing happens. Now that's the 2 plus effect that wants to give Lumen Class Frigate its Anthem ability. And then there's the 12 plus effect that wants to give it Flying and Lifelink. And then there's the effect from Humility that wants to take all the abilities away. Now, maybe you're wondering why I didn't combine the effects from the Lumen Class Frigate together. 
And that's because they're actually different continuous effects generated by separate static abilities. And you're right, usually I would talk about both of them together, but it turns out there's actually a very relevant difference between these, which I'll get to in a little bit. For now, let's talk about the effect that wants to give the Anthem ability to Loom Class Frigate. Applying Humility's Lose All Abilities effect before this changes whether this effect exists. So we say that Continuous Effect depends on Humility's and it waits to apply until after the Humility effect does. Of course, after the Humility effect applies, the other effect won't exist. So there's no way the Lumen Class Frigate will get the Anthem ability. And this is where we get to the difference that I mentioned. You see, the 12 plus effect is part of the same continuous effect that made Lumen Class Frigate a creature in layer 4. And that's important because if a continuous effect starts to apply in one layer, it will continue to apply to the same set of objects in every subsequent layer, meaning there is no dependency between Humility's Remove All Abilities and the 12 plus effect, because even if you apply the Humility first, the 12 plus effect will still exist. The relative order between these two continuous effects is therefore determined by timestamps. If Humility entered the battlefield after Lumen Class Frigate, then its effect will apply last, and the Lumen Class Frigate really won't have any abilities. But if the timestamps are in the other order, then the Lumen Class Frigate will give itself flying and lifelink after Humility takes all abilities away, and I think that's pretty cool. And in the last layer, we're going to have the same thing going on. The timestamps will determine whether Humility gets to make the Frigate a 1 1 or whether the Frigate gets to make itself a 3 5. Whichever one gets to apply last will win. So the end result is that Lumen Class Frigate will end up looking like this or like this, depending on whether it entered the battlefield before or after Humility. And if you'd like more information about this interaction, I talked about a similar case when I did my How Does Shoe If It Work video last week. Just skip to the end where I'm covering the interaction with Possessed David. And yeah, I guess this probably isn't the ideal answer either as far as being intuitive goes, but so I still think the layer system could still use a little bit of work. But then again, abilities that remove effects are never going to work intuitively with cards that rely on having abilities to function, so I don't know. And if you thought that was the most messed up thing that could happen because of spacecraft, you're almost right. But actually, did you know that spacecraft was a subtype before Edge of Eternities? It's true. It just wasn't an artifact subtype, yeah. Now, technically there's no problem with having one subtype associated with two or more card types. For example, every instant subtype is a sorcery subtype too. Still, I have to think that it was not intentional, and if the rules manager would have realized that this was a thing, we probably would have ended up with spaceships or space hyphen craft or some made up magic word instead of a duplicate subtype. As far as weird stuff that can happen because of this, it's not a lot. So if you could somehow manage to make an artifact plane hyphen spacecraft, it would not be evident which card type its spacecraft type was correlated with, so that could be kind of awkward if I somehow had it lose one of its types. Uh, fortunately, planes aren't real, <clears throat> sorry, traditional magic cards, so there aren't really any ways to do stuff like that as far as I could tell. Planes cannot have more than one subtype, so it would get interesting if you could have some artifact that naturally had multiple subtypes to become a plane, I guess. It isn't possible to use grav kill to exile the dining car because when a spell or ability uses a description of an object that includes a card subtype like this, it means a permanent with that subtype on the battlefield. If there was some way to get the dining car into your graveyard, you could return it to the battlefield with one of these fellows, but uh, that seems like a tough ask too. Still, I'm sure the creative deck builders out there will be able to figure something fun out to do with all of this. But that's all I have for you today. How did you do? Join me again next time for another daily ruling. Until then, I hope you have a great day.